we're, we're here in Tromsø, uh, Norway, in the far north. Further north than the Arctic Circle, where I live in Fairbanks. And uh, why that matters is because of uh, a few things it go. about the, the uh, magnetic fields and the electric field. So, so we are at a place where the uh, there's the L6 line. Yep. Earth is a giant magnet. There's these field lines coming around Earth. It's like a big magnetic bubble. But the sun is pushing on that field. So it creates like a like a like a teardrop. Like a tadpole. Right? You know, you've seen pictures of that. It, 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 so the, the sun right now is creating a bow shock about three Earth radii. You know, and then there's this beautiful uh, field line set you but they go around Earth. Or the moon. The moon orbits the Earth every 30 days. There's more water on the moon than there is in Scandinavia. I met uh, three astronauts. That is, you know, down there. You know, Sergei Kit, the Russian. You know, I was with him in Russia. You know, he he was in space. Uh, other people, you know, but they. There's astronauts, so it's, it's, you know, I, I hope to be on the moon, so, but I, it, it's it's because I want to study the water deposits there. I'm not trying to, you know, be better than anybody or whatever, but it's, it's we identified that the North and South Pole of the Moon have significant water, and our paper speaks for the results. Uh, to recite all of the evidence, uh, it's published. I thought it meant so. What, what the significance of that is like, okay, so somebody might ask, why should we go to the moon? Like, why should we even do anything on the moon? Well, it turns out that there is a significant amount of helium-3. Oh, yeah. You know, um, that is important because for fusion reactors, for what you've heard about fusion, you know, this... Yeah, yeah, nuclear fusion. fusion yeah. yeah, so there is a tremendous amount of uh, resources on the moon and I it, it, uh, well the biggest project on earth right now the biggest engineering project it costs 160 billion euros so one fifth uh, yeah about one fifth of Norway's economy is being spent on a fusion reactor in France called the Eustodium right uh, well it's complicated but there it's, it's called ITAR it was an international throwing a nuclear reactor in France. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're, uh, EU paid 12%, the United States paid 12%, China paid 12%, Rodney paid 12%. It's a, it's a world project. Yeah. It's not sanctioned, you know, it's, 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 it's on plan. And uh, yeah, we, we put out fusion, but we need the helium-3 because you can add a proton to it and get this reaction. Yeah. Uh, hopefully more energy than that. I mean, so this is a nuclear reaction. This is a fusion. The yeah. uh, camera might want to see. The sun, is that fusion? Uh, fission is uh, taking, uh, you know, uh, like a radioactive material, putting it down. Nuclear. And, uh, and, and bombarding it with protons, uh, neutrons. And the water slows it down. But this is fusion, which is a different process. So... Fusion is like bottling a star. Imagine that process, but bottling it in a tokamak, which is like you are you are spinning uh, protons yeah. uh, to 100 million degrees. So, a uh, little trivia question: Where's the hottest place on Earth? It's where the fusion reactor is. Oh, yeah. 100 million degrees low. Think about that. Sure. And the only way you can do that is with magnets, so it's a tokamak. But yeah. Earth is a giant tokamak. Yeah. We have a Van Allen radiation belt, and so when you see the aurora, you're seeing the uh, uh, E cross B field, this is an electrojet. Yeah. And what's weird with the aurora is that most of the time you see the aurora here, get, even though it, it's, it's out right now, we just can't see it. You can't see it because it's yeah. flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But uh, what's unique about it is that you have, I have that's the big issue that one you can see the electric field that's rare you just can't see that we see the magnetic fields yeah humans you know we use the magnetic fields like compasses
when we look at the carbon that goes into CO2 and that goes into methane, uh, it, it comes with a number of uh, isotopes, where the uh, stable isotope are carbon-13, that's the one that we see the most, um, and then there's an unstable one called carbon-14, uh, and that is used extensively for dating things. So, so, so you and me, when we sit here and uh, breathe in the air, uh, we we breathe in CO two molecules or take in CO two molecules when we eat something with carbon in that has a, a given fraction of uh, carbon thirteen to carbon fourteen. Um, that that's the fraction that we that we um, uh, we live in now. If and and God forbid, if, if if one of us then dies, then we will not take in any carbon anymore. And the 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 carbon fourteen will start to decay, uh, and after five and a half thousand years, only half of the carbon fourteen would be yet left, and that could be used to say uh, how long we have been dead, and and that's used for for more ecological dating and and stuff like uh, stuff like that, um, and uh, the 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 carbon fourteen uh, comes. Um, Mainly from cosmic rays, uh, can be cosmic rays from the sun, so uh, charged particles from the sun, or from the galaxy from the supernova explosion, that then lead to some cascade processes in the atmosphere that form carbon forty. Uh, and I mean, over long time scale, those two sources are relatively stable. Uh, the sun changes with this eleven-year time scale. As some longer time scale also, but but it's relatively uh, stable. But then we had the the nuclear test in the in the fifties uh, and sixties uh, that also produced a lot of carbon and produced a lot of carbon fourteen. Uh, and they are it, it's really clear that we can see them when we uh, look at at uh, so so if 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 you find something that that. Uh, that died after the 1950s. It it contains much more carbon-14 than, than anything before that. Actually, so much so 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 it's not possible to use carbon-14 dating after 1950. So so, archaeologists studying us uh, thousand years from now will not be able to use that method to 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 find a hole. And and that's of course relates uh, geoscience and space science to. Uh, security, uh, because I mean, uh, uh, well, we, I think we all know that these nu- nuclear tests and nuclear bombs in, in general are, are, are stupid. But but they are also actually, first of all, are very visible when when we do science, but therefore also pose a problem for us uh, do so. Uh, and that that sort of also relates to uh, to climate because I mean. Um, uh, one thing that's that's interesting to understand is the carbon cycle. Uh, so, so I talked about that, that uh, when we emit CO two, it stays for a hundred years in in the atmosphere. Uh, and what then happens is that that it's it's washed out with rain, for example, or it's taken actually it's taken up by plants and by the oceans. I mean, the main main source of taking uh, CO two out of the atmosphere is is the ocean. Where it's then uh, mixed in, uh, but exactly how that process works is, is something that, that is a very active uh, research field, uh, and um, and is those important to to understand the things about that I was talking about before. Uh, so when we observe a given uh, concentration of carbon, of CO two, of methane. Uh, where where does it uh, does it then uh, come from? And there we can actually use the the nuclear burning test to, to as a very good tracer, because um, uh, it takes of the order of decades uh, for 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 these circulations to happen. And we had this peak in carbon fourteen in the 1950s due to the nuclear test uh, that we then now can observe. How does that um, uh, peak? Transfer into the ocean circulation and so on. We are working on calculating basic space debris 
distribution. And for from your results uh, with shooting two radars into the air, uh, what did you discover? Well, we discovered um, the space debris clouds, which uh, came from the anti-satellite weapons test conducted, conducted by India and Russia. So uh, um, very harmful for the space environment because yeah, we came to the conclusion basically um, according to the UN guidelines, space is a finite resource. And this is because not all satellites are just equally distributed in space, but there are certain orbits which are much more popular than ours. And if uh, this satellite collides with another satellite close to such an orbit, that can really endanger the safety of space operation. That can endanger satellites which do important tasks like Earth observation, climate change research, weather prediction, communication. Yeah, well, um, with detecting space objects, it's, it's more trivial than detecting the ionosphere. Because if you want to detect a space object, then you just uh, basically um, you emit a pulse from the radar, which has a high power that is directed by the large dish. The larger the dish and the smaller the frequency, the more you can direct the beam into one direction. And then um, the object, if it's um, made out of metal, which is often the case, uh, reflects the radar beam approximately actually like a sphere, so appro approximately in all directions. And that radar radiation then comes back to the radar, a very, very small part of it actually. It is, um, it is actually beyond imagination how, how small, the, small the fraction of, of power is that comes back. And uh, that is collected now, now by the dish and um, focused towards a receiver, which can detect the amount of radiation reflected by the object. And if the, um, if, the, if the signal is strong enough, then we assume that an object is traveling um, up there. And um, what can we now measure, find out uh, about this object? There are basically three important parameters we can detect, measure with this reader. Well, it's of course just the signal strength. If the object is very large, then the signal strength is larger. However, it isn't that simple, because if the object is farther away, then the signal strength is also lower. And if the um, object does not fly directly through the uh, radar beam, but only passes uh, the radar beam a bit off-center, then the signal is also lower. So you see, it isn't that simple. However, there's another quantity which we can measure quite precisely, and that is the distance to the radar. So, as I told you, we are sending out the pulse, and then some pulse might come back. And we can measure the time distance uh, of, uh, between the pulse being sent and the pulse being received. And if we halve this time distance, and this is just the traveling time of the radar radiation to the target. And then we just uh, meet the speed of light. And uh, because the radar radiation is traveling at the speed of light, just like any other electromagnetic magnetic radiation, just like light, light itself. And we can uh, uh, thus determine the distance to the object quite precisely and independent of where it is at the moment in the radar beam. What we can also measure, and that is the third important quantity, is how fast the object is moving towards the radar uh, or away from it. Because um, some of you might have heard of the so-called Doppler shift. So if, uh, um, say, um, a vehicle with a siren passes you, um, you hear the siren differently when the uh, that when the vehicle uh, goes away and um, you he hear it at a deeper tone when it goes away and in the higher tone when it approaches you that's Doppler effect and that also happens with electromagnetic radiation like radar radiation 